All right, I am Melissa Smith and I am a research ecologist at the USDA Agricultural Research Service Invasive Plant Research Laboratory in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We look at how invasive plants affect primarily the Florida landscape and how to utilize biological control along with other methods to control large-scale invasive plants and I came to this place uh, through my graduate work in community ecology that focused on invasive plants in particular and so um, I will be focusing today though on how interagency cooperation between federal state and local agencies helped to forward the um, uh, success of uh, invasive uh, plant control campaign uh, in the Florida landscape and particularly uh, against an aquatic wetland invader. So this is primarily a talk that revolves around people cooperating. Ecosystems don't really cooperate, they interact, but we were, are fortunate enough to work in an environment in Florida in which local and state agencies are readily at the same table. So this includes U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the USDA, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the University of Florida. We work extensively uh, in the national parks. So uh, Everglades National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve. And then much of our support comes through a cooperative uh, cooperation between the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the South Florida Water Management District. And I'll talk about that a little later in, in, in the presentation. And this is a picture of my colleagues, my uh, technicians, and the group that does most of the work here at the Invasive Plant Research Lab. Many of these are interns, many of these are low-level technicians who gather the data and really do all of the on-the-boots work, and they rarely get recognition. So I just wanted to take a minute and, and really recognize the people in this picture because they are the heart and soul of a lot of invasive plant research. So let's start with a little bit of background. South Florida and Florida in general exists on a peninsula that ranges from about 10 to 15 feet above sea level to right about one or two feet above sea level. And so we interact with both land and water really frequently. Historically, the chain of Kissimmee Lakes, which is north of uh, Lake Okeechobee, flowed through a series of underground springs and rivers and lakes into one of the largest lakes in North America, Lake Okeechobee. And from there, it would go either out through the Caloosahatchee River, a little bit of westward flow, but primarily you had a north to south flow from the Kissimmee through South Florida. And that propagated a massive wetland system that included marsh ecosystems, it included deeper wetland systems, lakes, rivers, sloughs, and this historical flow is what created what we think of as the Everglades. Now this, however, doesn't uh, facilitate human uh, inhabitants very well. So historically, human inhabitation uh, consisted mostly about, of people living on the coasts. So this included the Tequesta, as well as um, some other groups that were mostly coastal peoples, but would travel inland, sometimes right about here to higher areas to do some trading. And then when the Seminole and Nikasuki came down in the early part of the 20, or excuse me, 19th century, uh, they hid in the swamps, quote unquote, in South Florida uh, in order to escape, um, escape capture. So for most of, of human history in South Florida, uh, they inhabited the higher ridges on the east and west coasts rather than the interior, which left the interior open to birds and other wildlife and a wholly unique ecosystem that is a um, 
a conglomeration of subtropical temperate uh, floras as well as wetlands. However, uh, when, when Florida opened up to settlers and to larger populations, uh, it was during the early part of the 20th century and late part of the 19th century when plumage and plumes on hats was very important and a huge economic driver for harvesting birds out of the Everglades. So this all occurs within a historical context. You can see behind the picture on the right that you've got Dade County pine as well as probably um, some planted maples, but you don't see the characteristic Australian pine in the background like you do now. In addition to harvesting out of the Everglades, uh, there was a big campaign into making the interior of Florida more usable, quote unquote. This meant draining or canalizing much of the water that flowed naturally south of Lake Okeechobee in a wide swath. Uh, so, so that some of that land would dry up and be arable for agriculture. These were called the Central and South Florida projects and those started in the 40s. Uh, land reclamation started as early as the 1920s. And this was to really promote uh, the use of Florida land for sugar and citrus and tomatoes and to really help Florida's not only agricultural boom, but the housing boom. Uh, people wanted to live in Florida for the same reasons then as they do now. It's warm in the middle of January and the climate during winter is, is very uh, conducive to, uh, to human activities. However, this increased uh, disturbance as well as increasing plant importations. Uh, people, when we move to new places, often bring plants uh, that are familiar with us. And we had two major importers in Florida. One was with the USDA, David Fairchild, and he had a collection center in Florida, which is now the Fairchild Botanical Garden, as well as his personal home. And he brought in a lot of different plants and plant species, uh, some of which are now invasive. Uh, Henry Nearling also brought in a lot of plant species. He was up uh, north of of Lake Okeechobee in central Florida. Uh, and then there was also the Royal Palm Nursery. So all of these groups are bringing in plants, subtropical, tropical plants to, uh, to grow and to use in the burgeoning horticulture industry. One of the plants that they brought in was punk tree or melaleuca. So melaleuca quinquinervia. It's not the same as what you traditionally think of as a tea tree. That's a different melaleuca species. But starting in the late part of the 19th century, Royal Palm Nursery, Nearling uh, in central Florida, and the USDA brought in many, many uh, individuals of Melaleuca quinquinervia from the east coast of Australia. Um, this importation was primarily for horticultural uh, usage and um, and so we can find historical trees all throughout old neighborhoods in Florida especially South Florida so in my neighborhood in particular there are two trees which unbeknownst to my neighbors I cord and they are from the 1920s so there's these are really old trees that people initially planted for uh, for their looks it's a nice big tree um, but it also grows rapidly under a myriad of conditions, especially in wet conditions. And so as the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was conducting its, its uh, canalization or channelizing uh, projects in order to uh, help make Florida more livable for both people and agriculture, they used this tree, uh, Melaleuca, in order to shore up those levees. Um, this is all happening though at the same time when folks are starting to promote the idea of conserving the wetlands in South Florida from the lake and whatever is left south. Um, 
Ernest Coe, who is pictured here, was instrumental in getting the park designated. So the park was designated in 1934, and here he is sitting in one of the, you know, cypress marshes. And then in 1947, the Everglades National Park was, um, was dedicated. However, this is long after we have, uh, we have gone beyond the point of altering uh, crucial ecological processes such as water flow and hydrology, as well as importing plants that drastically change things like water flow, hydrology, and fire. Interestingly enough, pictured in the back here, you can see Australian pines, which is another invasive species we have in South Florida. And there's a big basket of citrus that shows the often uh, conflicting interests of conservation in South Florida. We want to have agriculture and we want to promote agriculture in South Florida, but we often do so at the peril of, of conserving uh, critical habitat for species of concern. One of the major champions of, of Everglades National Park was this woman pictured in the middle, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And so this illustrates at the very beginning how the establishment of parks and of conservation areas is almost entirely a, uh, a, a union and, an, and a cooperation between federal agencies who, who manage and who can purchase the land and private citizens who can champion and lobby on behalf of those, those um, places. That said, Everglades is, is unique because it's preserved, not because it has major geological uh, uh, features such as big mountains or beautiful lakes. It's preserved because of its critical habitat and function. Uh, and so it's preserved for its biology. And that is captured well in Ms. Stoneman Douglas's uh, seminal book, The Everglades River of Grass. So as we move through the 30s and 40s, we're discovering that we want to have a larger conservation idea, but we're still bringing in plants, and that includes Melaleuca. It was planted extensively through the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s. It then be, got onto everybody's radar that this was perhaps a species that could self-promote, uh, that could sustain itself, and that could uh, increase its range throughout much of South Florida. So in the 60s and 70s and even the 80s, we had uh, huge areas that were now being overtaken by this tree. Unfortunately, the natural processes of of fire that are part of the South Florida landscape uh, did uh, caused a lot of damage because when burned, Melaleuca releases huge amounts of of volatile organic compounds, and those can be very irritating to, to people that inhale the smoke. And then because Melaleuca is extremely good at uptaking water, we also experienced something we never really thought we would, which was drought. And so it compounded issues with hydrology that were already starting with moving water instead of north or instead of from north to south starting to move water from east to west out of what is a natural slough. Like most large-scale invaders, Melaleuca uh, has a myriad of ecosystem scale impacts including altering water depth and surface flows which are in critical for uh, aquifer recharge in South Florida. All of us who live down here are, um, are benefactors of the Florida, uh, Florida aquifer, which uh, for our drinking water, uh, and that is provided by water that flows over the Everglades and is, it flows through porous limestone and into that aquifer about a thousand feet down. It basically stopped uh, 
succession in these communities. So not only did Melaleuca uh, changed the hydrology, but it also made it so that plant recruitment under a uh, melaleuca canopy was quite difficult. It altered light availability and nutrient availability, as well as disturbance regimes. So in the late 70s and 80s, we really started to talk about this. And that's because it was affecting massive areas of land that were not only controlled by private citizens, uh, but also, uh, also huge areas of federally owned and managed land. So the area in light gray that doesn't have an outline is what we consider historic Everglades wetlands. So these are areas that are not part of uh, a highland hammock or anything like that, pinelands. Uh, these are areas that, that Melaleuca could potentially grow in. Areas with, that are bounded are uh, Big Cypress National Preserve, which is this area here. To the south of that is Everglades National Park. And this area right here, uh, which is actually maintained by a series of levees and boundaries, is Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. All of these areas are what we consider the greater Everglades ecosystem, and we manage those or we address problems on those sort of holistically. The dark area, though, is the pretreatment melaleuca distribution. So this is before uh, large-scale removal efforts began uh, in the 1990s. Just to re-emphasize not, not only the fact that these are federally managed lands, uh, but you also have these uh, water management area uh, that water management area designated lands, uh, which are often called storm treatment areas, uh, storm water treatment areas, uh, and those are managed by the state. You have tribal lands. So this here is the Miccosukee Indian Reservation. To the north of that is the Big Cypress Reservation. Uh, so all of these are, are stakeholders in Melaleuca control and of making sure that that ecosystem processes function well. However, when we get above here, this is the entire um, South Lake Okeechobee agricultural area. And then we have huge agricultural areas down here in, in the Homestead Redlands area. So again, we have this interplay uh, with, with agriculture, with large populate densely populated areas that are directly adjacent to massive conservation areas. So let's quickly go through Melaleuca control. We've sort of talked about uh, the evolution of a conservation ethic in Florida, but really beginning in the 1970s, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission started investigating herbicidal control, and that was at, um, just before the U.S. Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife, or excuse me, South Florida Water Management District did several surveys of Melaleuca density in Florida. <clears throat> In 1979, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began doing herbicide trials on Melaleuca at Lake Okeechobee along that southern levee area. In 1982, in order to address the burgeoning exotic plant problem in Florida, the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council, or FLEPSI, was formed. In 86, the USDA Agricultural Research Service down here at the Invasive Plant Research Lab uh, began to conduct surveys for biological control agents primarily in its native range of uh, Australia but also New Caledonia. And then the South Florida Water Management District and the, and the National Park Service uh, started to conduct serial reconnaissance flights. So these are overhead flights to survey Melaleuca again from the air as well as other invasive species. In 1996, uh, we had the formation of the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force, which then uh, promoted and prompted the formation uh, and the legislation that now governs the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. In 97, uh, and I'll talk about this obviously in more detail, that's when our first biological control agents were approved for release. And in 2002, the Invasive Plant Research Lab embarked upon a multi-agency cooperation called Tame Melaleuca or the 
area-wide uh, <clears throat> area wide study for uh, melaleuca eradication. Um, so this uh, idea, or excuse me, melaleuca control, this idea was then to utilize uh, multiple plots on multiple different types of land in order to uh, achieve long-term control. The main goal of this and really most of our studies is to look at how can we integrate different management techniques in order to achieve long-term control. One technique that we looked at is mechanical control. So this is when we use bulldozers and uh, chippers and grinders in order to uh, destroy large trees. And Sometimes when we look, think about, I'll just explain the quote at the top, when we think about Everglades restoration efforts, um, uh, an official from the Department of Interior probably put it best that when we're talking about restoration and Everglades landscape teeming with exotic species is not a, res a restored Everglades. And the effort of removing Melaleuca is there in order to reestablish better ecosystem function without this exotic species. Mechanical control can remove large trees, but it's incredibly labor intensive and expensive. Uh, it can cause non-target damage. If there are native plants in the understory, they're going to be uh, affected and probably harmed by, by a chipper. Um, it doesn't control coppicing, which is what happens when we cut the top of a tree off, but the stump is still alive. And so you get big bushy outgrowth from that stump. And then Melaleuca is a prolific seed producer and uh, and mechanical removal does nothing for reducing seed recruitment. Most of you are familiar with chemical control, which is utilizing herbicides uh, to get rid of invasive plants. Uh, the, the pros are that with certain removal techniques, we can get rid of large trees. It's very effective. Uh, hand spraying techniques that uh, target specific trees and specific individual trees can minimize non-target impacts. Um, but again, it's very labor intensive, especially when you're talking about Everglades habitats. People are often walking out in, um, in wet, if not entirely inundated conditions. They're remote. They've got to get there via an airboat. Um, if we decide that the that the infestation is too high, then they're, they can utilize aerial spray, so spraying from a helicopter or a fixed wing aircraft, but that can kill massive amounts of non-target species. And again, <clears throat> the seed bank of Melaleuca can be massive, and so there's no control of seedling recruitment. So you'll notice that I've mentioned seedling recruitment several times. So in our first effort to find a biological control mechanism, we uh, often target where uh, the other two control, me control mechanisms uh, are falling short. The pros of biological control uh, in Melaleuca is that it reduces seedling recruitment once these insects are introduced, there's really no maintenance or follow-up costs except for the cost of studying impact. These are self-sustaining populations and because of host range testing, we know that there's no non-target uh, direct damage. The cons are that it's expensive to develop uh, biological control up front um, and it is just that it is control not eradication so just think that uh, these are self uh, perpetuating populations they're never going to eat all of their particular host plant they will always uh, you know keep enough for a population to go so let's explain uh, for those that are not familiar with classical biological control a little bit about how this works. Uh, so say that you have this bad plant, but again, there are no bad plants. It's just a plant that is growing where it shouldn't grow. So, um, but never mind the verbiage. So we will go back to where it's native. In this case, Melaleuca is native to Australia. And interestingly enough, many of our invasive plants in North America are native to either Australia or Asia. Um, shows that we were over there getting plants pretty frequently in the 19th and 20th centuries. So we'll survey its native range and we focus on uh, 
specific specialists, not generalists. So uh, mam mammalian uh, herbivores are often generalists. So we generally look at the insect flora. Uh, in this case, we want to make sure that it is extremely host specific, that the the insects that we choose or the arthropods, we also utilize mites, uh, are will only eat that plant and that plant alone. So occasionally you can get a little bit of test feeding on something else, but we want to make sure that reproduction and primary feeding only happen on the target species. And so these, in, these species then spend about six to eight years, or excuse me, four to eight years in in a federal biosafety level two quarantine facility. So nothing that comes into this facility goes out of this facility until it has been uh, permitted to by the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. So APHIS gives a permit. And once it's released though, after showing host uh, specificity and other, um, other benchmarks, then it's uh, approved for release and we start mass rearing and releasing this insect. <clears throat> Just to sort of give you an idea of what happens in the field. So this is a field host specificity test. We released uh, multiple individuals, multiple adults and followed them through um, the top graph is adult recruitment onto plants so whether or not adults were present on species and then we also looked at larval recruitment so how many um how many days larvae um or how many larvae were found on each species uh throughout the year so you'll notice so um, that Melaleuca quinquinervia is the square and it's right here we did actually get um adult recruitment on a non-native uh, species, <clears throat> but in larval recruitment, um, we get primarily all of the larval recruitment is on Melaleuca quinquinervia and then a couple of other Melaleuca species, none of which are native to Florida. So this is a very good species in terms of its ability to specialize on Melaleuca quinquinervia and maintain those populations over time. So we utilized this integrated management approach and brought multiple stakeholders that specialize in each one of these efforts into the larger study. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the South Florida Water Management District focused on mechanical removal. UF IFAS, so the um, research arm of the University of Florida and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission uh, helped with mechanical removal. And then uh, UF, as well as the, the Invasive Plant Research Lab, focused on developing biological control. We had several <clears throat> research sites throughout South Florida and throughout the range of both the historical Everglades and Melaleuca. All of these sites had um, both uh, had biological control organisms at them. So they had the Melaleuca weevil, which is this very cute guy, um, as well as the Melaleuca psyllid. So these are, um, these are sap feeders uh, and they produce this flocculence. So both of these are very effective and, um, and self-moving organisms. The biggest issue though is that these guys require soil in which to pupate. These insects do not. We had two control sites where we used pesticides in order to keep these insects off to look at the effects of just uh, mechanical or chemical removal, but every other site had some combination of chemical, mechanical, and biological control. Um, we utilized hack and squirt, aerial sprays, uh, chainsaws, and a feller bench, which is a, an attachment to uh, um, a backhoe that grinds everything in its path and we found that permanently in permanently wet sites where the weevil can't can't propagate the psyllids thrive in places where both we the psyllid and the weevil are present we had a 99 percent reduction in seed production and recruitment this is massive for controlling melaleuca
At this point then large trees can be treated and removed and maintenance costs then for Melaleuca um, dominated lands have decreased significantly since the 90s, so over the past 20 years. And pictures always help explain things better than words. So this is um, Moorhaven Marsh at Lake Okeechobee. Uh, this is 1994 before uh, treatment in earnest began. All of this green area is thick Melaleuca trees. This is from 2007. There are remnant Melaleuca trees, but each one of these can be treated and easily removed. And it's primarily native habitat now. And that is because we went in and removed uh, these large swaths of trees because of the land area and the fact that there is some dry area, weevils were able to um, to be present in those and they pretty much stopped seedling recruitment. And then uh, uh, the occasional spray is conducted in order to remove individual trees. So what once was a landscape level invasion is now uh, individual trees. And this is what we're seeing throughout the landscape. So in 1995, each one of these cells that's darker colored, darker red, is a heavy infestation of Melaleuca. In 2001, we start getting major efforts to treat Melaleuca, especially on uh, water management district land. Um, so we still have a couple of um, a couple of places where we have heavy infestations, but you can see that especially down here in the southern buffer areas, we're decreasing these efforts. In 2005, uh, same story, and in 2010, uh, we've really managed to push uh, Melaleuca and, and Melaleuca-dominated lands uh, to uh, specific areas that have either no treatment or that the treatment that's available is difficult because of the landscape, particularly very wet areas. More recently, we found uh, through aerial sketch mapping, uh, so this is where we go over um, each one of these squares as a grid and we fly over them and estimate coverage. Um, Melaleuca and the severity of the Melaleuca invasion as of 2013 has uh, decreased pretty significantly. So at one point in time, uh, low, moderate, and high invasions were equally shared. Um, most of the invasion uh, or most of the Melaleuca dominated sites are now low, um, low Melaleuca abundance. So this is again a major, um, a major accomplishment and, and continued success because of multi-agency cooperation and utilizing methods uh, including chemical, mechanical, and biological control for an overall um, integrated pest management success story. So we moved then uh, and, and, and utilized the framework from this Tame Melaleuca project uh, in the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. So it's approximately the same footprint as we had before with the Tame Melaleuca, except that we're now including the Kissimmee chain of rivers and lakes. And um, it is tentatively entitled the Melaleuca Eradication and Other Exotic Plants Project. And again, this comes under that idea that a restored Everglades does not include uh, invasive exotic plants. This is a partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the South Florida Water Management District as supporters, and then the Department of Interior and the USDA ARS as providers uh, of resources, um, either travel resources or in the case of ARS, uh, uh, land resources to mass rear and release biological control insects. So the idea then is that we can <clears throat> conduct host range tests in this federal quarantine facility. We can, we can uh, ensure host range specificity, that the insects are gonna be you know, a, a 
good utilization uh, and, and be effective in the field. And then once we have the permit to release, we can then immediately move them over to the adjacent mass rearing annex that was completed in 2013. This is officially the first completed project of the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Um, and we are working hard to make sure that we are still um, on top of our plans and goals. Um, this facility houses four offices, uh, three postdocs, and then two large labs that focus on mass rearing um, four insect arthropod combinations. So right now we're focused on another wetlands invader, uh, so sort of an ecotone invader, but really problematic uh, old world climbing fern, as well as an aquatic macrophyte water hyacinth, which everyone in, knows, and then also uh, a, a sort of uplands invader air potato. So these are accomplished again by, by hardworking folks who literally day in and day out rear insects and release them. And since um, doing so, um, we, we have annual meetings with our stakeholders to make sure that we're meeting benchmarks and that the goals that are set forth in the, um, in the proposal and in the plan of, of action are still relevant. And that's one of the things that's made this successful. So we focused on these three uh, species and we've released near over 2 million insects uh, for controlling like Godium microfilum, uh, water hyacinth, and air potato. Just to give you some successes from this, from these efforts uh, and from SERP in, in terms of our uh, portion of SERP, we've had significant progress uh, towards control and maintenance with Liliaceris chenai, this cute little red beetle, on air potato vine. So we've pretty much cut back uh, recruitment from their aerial tubers and height has been reduced, uh, coverage has been reduced, and, um, and we're really entering a, a point where we're maintenance is is feasible especially if there's other intervention controls such as chemical spraying um, the ligodium uh, is a different story we're still sort of in its infancy but this little brown moth has been seen and we've had several more events like the one that's pictured here on the left where we have massive population explosions where millions of individuals are flying around laying eggs and their caterpillars are consuming massive quantities of foliage. This is a, an old um, hammock that was overtaken by Melaleuca at the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. These dead sticks are old Melaleuca trees uh, that, are, that have been treated. Um, so they, are, they were killed by um, uh, by herbicide and then came in a secondary invader, old world climbing fern. So this is an insidious invader. It's spread by spores. It can pretty much travel anywhere in, in Florida and um, it's, it's particularly bad in wildland areas. That said, all of this brown is areas in which this moth and its caterpillar have been consuming. So since we started SERP, we've seen far more of these population explosion events. So again, more work needs to be done, but we're considering this a promising sign. Um, in terms of the world's worst weed uh, on uh, Icornia crassipes or water hyacinth, uh, we've had some good successes in researching and developing um, IPM methods for um, utilizing the weevils that are out there now and have been out there for the last 30 years, as well as a new insect from South America, Megamella scutellaris, uh, in addition to reducing rates, uh, reduced rates rather of 2,4-D and herbicide. Uh, we've come up with some novel methods for surveying the populations and uh, we've worked with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, so again collaboration, 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 um, utilizing uh, their um, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones to release these insects in places that are difficult for us to get out. So um, again, we're continuing that 
interagency cooperation in order to move towards a common goal. Um, we've expanded biological control along the Kissimmee River drainage and we've been able to see um, our biological control insects, particularly Neomucetema conspercatalis, so that Ligodium moth, as well as uh, um, Megamella scutellaris on, on uh, water hyacinth. So adding the Kissimmee River drainage, we've been able to increase the total range of the biological control organisms throughout that, um, throughout that region and the larger SERP area. We would like to continue this um, momentum into future projects. As I said, um, Air Potato is a success at this point in the game and we're, we'll probably be moving one or two projects uh, from you know full mass rearing and release to other projects. One of those is is Brazilian pepper or shyness. So it's got these bright pink berries. It's sometimes called uh, pink peppercorns or Florida holly. It is one of the worst weeds in South Florida and had experienced a 16% increase, at least in what we could survey between 2010 and 2012. Like Ligodium, it proliferates in remote areas, including this Cape Sable area out here, which is not any place that anyone ever travels to, but because these seeds are eaten by birds and by other seed predators, they get carried away to, um, to far remote places. Um, it's very woody and brushy and impedes wildlife corridors and the ability of wildlife to move freely within areas. It infests more area than any other invasive plant in Florida. It's just big and burly and it's difficult to control. If you tr ever travel in Florida all up uh, and down the I-95 and Turnpike, you'll just see it along the roads. And again, um, it's not just along the roads, it's in some of our most remote wildlands. And in addition to Florida, it's problematic in Texas and Hawaii. Again, this is a plant with a wide ecological envelope. It can handle inundation, it can handle slightly saline, um, it can handle drying. So we're talking about something that's, that is difficult to get rid of. Um, we have two potential insects at currently for the control of, of Brazilian pepper. One of these is Califia terebinthifolius, and uh, this organism it, it, and its uh, congeners, which are still in quarantine, are really host specific, and they uh, form these galls, so they're leaf gallers. <clears throat> Another insect that is in the pipeline and has been approved for release, so Califia has been approved for release by the technical advisory group, is uh, Pseudothrips, uh, Pseudophilothrips ichini. So this is the Brazilian pepper thrips, and it attacks the tips and growing tips of, of Brazilian pepper. Both of these uh, were petitioned to tag in 2014 and both were re recommended for release in 2016. And, um, and so if we can utilize the same framework as we did, we know that we have, for the previous uh, projects, we know that we have established relationships with both land managers and, uh, and cooperators and supporters uh, to perpetuate these efforts indefinitely. Um, our cooperation with the University of Florida allows us to communicate readily with the public. Um, in terms of Florida and the DOI and releasing in uh, Everglades National Park, uh, we're able to readily obtain permits to release in both the park as well as Big Cypress National Preserve. And this promotes a general uh, idea of the safety and efficacy and acceptance of biological control. Uh, we've, we've demonstrated the safety and the usefulness of integrating it with other management techniques. Um, and then it also provides unique research and funding opportunities. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a community ecology scientist looking at species interactions in these novel systems uh, provides some really interesting research. Um, 
There are other aspects, though, of the interagency uh, cooperations and interactions that are not about boots on the ground getting rid of invasive species. One of these is importing insects. Remember that these plants are not native to North America. They come from other places. And so their natural enemies come from other places as well. And we conduct foreign exploration uh, in those places with our collaborators, especially the Australians. Um, those insects are imported into US-based quarantines. Uh, and those are um, that process is governed by the APHIS, USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, as well as US Fish and Wildlife Service. Host range testing is conducted in the quarantine facilities by universities as well as um, ARS. Um, we then uh, put everything together for the technical advisory group, which is governed by APHIS, but is made up of multiple individuals from multiple stakeholding agencies and groups, including tribal organizations. Um, and then U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, will conduct the Invasive Species Act uh, compliance as, or excuse me, um, Endangered Species Act compliance, and uh, APHIS will, con will conduct NEPA compliance. And then finally, a permit is issued. So you can see that throughout this entire process, there are regulatory interactions as well as uh, research collaborator collaborative interactions uh, before an insect even ever gets released. Um, just to sort of give you um, an idea of some of the, the places where we have interactions and where there's potential for confusion is that at the point of importation, we are, uh, there is shared regulatory oversight. So we are looked at by both USDA, USDA APHIS, who provides an importation permit and the, does the inspections at the port of entry, but all wildlife entering into the United States has to go through a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement inspection at the port of entry. Um, so those are governed under, excuse me, two totally different mandates. Um, complete host range tests, I, like I said before, are evaluated by the technical advisory group uh, for biological control agents of weeds. And again, this includes members of universities, of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, of APHIS, of tribal groups who could be affected. So the TAG uh, group is supposed to be really a group of stakeholders that can evaluate the data and the merit for a specific petition. Um, the environmental assessment is conducted by both U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as APHIS. And then finally, the permit for release is issued by APHIS. One thing that we've run into is that because of several issues dating back several years, and I won't get into those, um, we haven't had any insects that have made it through the entire process of uh, regulatory oversight. I'll just use the two that we're concerned about for Brazilian pepper. Um, the Califia and the Pseudophyllothrips ichini have both been recommended for release by the TAG, TAG group. Um, there is a dual effort to complete the environmental assessment uh, with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who conducts the Section 7 uh, compliance and investigations, and then APHIS which will do the public comment and the NEPA compliance. Um, because of, because of some issues. Um, none of these have been completed since 2012. That is actually not true. Um, well, it's sort of true. That none have actually been completely completed, but I will say that Califia has now uh, completed the Section 7 uh, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and will just be uh, starting its NEPA compliance with APHIS. So look for that for the public commenting uh, period that should open fairly soon. But how do we, how do we uh, make sure that we are being safe, make sure that these uh, tests are robust, uh, but also that we are um, able to utilize the, the research and the efforts that have gone into making sure that these are safe organisms for biological control? Do we need to increase communication? Do we need to have uh, annual meetings between the regulatory agencies and uh, petitioners? 
does there need to be an increase in transparency where we can follow, um, you know, much like you follow a FedEx package from point A to point B, that we can follow the petition from the original petition date all the way through um, and have folks that are conducting these, um, these compliance uh, investigations check boxes to say what's complete, what's not complete, and what's needed. Um, this is an expensive process, a human expensive process. Can we talk about cost sharing uh, between the petitioning agencies, uh, the two, the, the permitting agency, APHIS, as well as the investigating agency, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? And then finally, a question, uh, again, for petitioners, and, and without risking seeming like this is a pay to play, but should there be a fee attached to filing a petition? Um, again, questions for other meetings and other places but hopefully the ball is now rolling on um, on these and I would really uh, like to thank those that are that are starting that ball rolling again after so many years it's, this is a really important tool to use uh, selfishly it, it's a really important tool to use in in South Florida where our wildland weeds are are massive problems but I know in other places especially the the west and the northeast um, the mid-atlantic really everywhere in North America we're combating these issues and this is a, a can be an effective tool as I've shown before uh, so just to close um, uh, long-term interagency goals uh, uh, can help us and long-term interagency interaction and collaborations help us to conserve the ecological function um, in communities and to reduce their level of invasiveness. Um, it allows us to cooperatively manage lands that are adjacent and especially watersheds where we have uh, water and other resources, animals, insects, plants, seeds, uh, moving from one place into another. As resources become more limited, uh, having interagency cooperations as, uh, is um, a good use of those resources and promotes efficiencies. And then finally, um, if we can duplicate the efficacy and the success of these previous integrated management projects, particularly like Tame Melaleuca or SERP, which we've been really successful to heretofore, um, we can make big strides in reducing uh, costs and management costs in aquatic wetland and terrestrial communities. And um, the previous um, uh, webinar had two questions and I will address both of those. The first question was regarding um, international collaborations. So I've talked about our state and federal collaborations, uh, but we do have international collaborations. So um, we work extensively with um, the the CSIRO in Australia, which is essentially their uh, resource research organization, and the our collaborators there uh, do much of the of the foreign exploration. And if we have plants that are from Australia, so I talked about Melaleuca, which is from Australia. It, we have another example, uh, earleaf acacia, which we're just starting on. So they can do the initial surveys. They can even do the initial host range tests to screen out uh, generalists before they ever even come over here. So it takes a huge amount of workload off of, uh, off of us and really streamlines the process. Uh, we also work with the Chinese Academy of Sciences um, and the Wuhan Botanical Garden in China. Um, we've worked extensively with Fudei in South America to get, um, to get the Megamelis scutellaris insect out. Um, so yes, we have, we have uh, you know, we're a science organization and a science agency at the uh, Agricultural Research Service. So our international collaborations are part of what makes this a successful endeavor. Um, the other question I got was regarding uh, the use of gene editing technology or CRISPR uh, to try and develop uh, biological control organisms that only last one generation um, and so it would basically be like a bio herbicide um, that's not really what our goal is with with 
biological control. Our goal with biological control, as I mentioned before, is to have um, indefinitely perpetuating populations of these monophagous, folivorous insects that that can last in perpetuity without any manipulation. So of course nothing is inherently without risk, but we try to mitigate that risk as much as possible in the initial host range test uh, portion of our, of our work. Um, so it's really, it would never be our goal to, to create, um, to create an organism that only lasts one generation. Rather, um, we, try to utilize the long established, long developed evolutionary relationships between specialist herbivores and their host plants. So with that, again, I'd like to thank our supporters, uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, South Florida Water Management Agency, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, as well as our many cooperators throughout the state of Florida and the federal government. So thank you very much.